ladies and gentlemen, independent Americans around the country and around the world. I am very thrilled to have the person that I think is the perfect guest for this episode. As we shift into a new phase of the show and the country shifts into a new phase in our history, we've got a leader who's been at a really important, important intersection for all of it. Uh, a guy I've been honored to know for a few years now. Uh, hopefully you've seen him out there uh, across the country, but a very important voice, especially now, and a person I consider a true patriot when that word's getting thrown around a lot, but uh, someone who cares deeply about this country, and I'm honored to have him with us right now. The great and powerful Evan McMullen joins us. Welcome, my friend. Thank you, Paul. Great to be with you, and, and th thank you very much for those very kind words, and, and right back at you, brother. It's been, it's been good knowing you for the last few years and in this challenging time in the country, and you're right, that word patriot does get thrown around too much, but I'm committed, as I hope you are, to taking it back, you know, and, and you're certainly a, a patriot as well, somebody who has put the, the interest of the country first for years and in many different ways. And uh, anyway, thank you very much for those kind words. Um, it's great to be with you today. There, there's a lot to unpack. I really want to talk with you about this moment in our in our country and what patriotism means. I really want to talk about what's happening in independent politics or in partisan politics as this show shifts into a new phase. You know, I think you're the perfect person to talk about that. Um, but let's let's start with uh, this moment. Uh, where are you in America and how are you? The pandemic's happening. We've had an insurrection. Where are you, Evan? And how are you? Well, physically, I'm in Washington, D.C. right now, but during uh, the pandemic, I've thankfully been able to be home most of the time in Utah. And so I've sort of been hiding out there and, you know, staying socially distanced and, and spending more time in the mountains uh, in Utah. We, you know, we've got some amazing mountains there. And in the summer, I'm, I'm among them, you know, trail running and hiking and climbing. And in the winter this year, I've been doing some skiing when I can. Uh, and otherwise, I've been taking road trips on the weekends to go do the same thing in Wyoming and Idaho and elsewhere out west. It's been it's been a, a silver lining. So I've been fine. You know, there's some challenges. I'm worried about my parents and things like that. But um, but, you know, uh, relatively speaking, I'm, I'm doing just fine and uh, on the road at the moment, but can't wait to get home. I love Utah. I've been there many times. Um, it kind of seems like maybe one of the most perfect places to ride out the pandemic. If I had to ride out a pandemic, Utah seems like a pretty good place to do it, right? I, th I think it is, you know? I mean, look, you can, you're surrounded in beauty. Uh, the people are nice. Uh, and you, there's just so much to do there. You don't, you don't have to stay cooped up in your place. You can get out and experience you know, all kinds of different topographies. You know, we've got these soaring world-class mountains uh, we've got deep canyons, we've got deserts, uh, you know, you name it. We've got salt flats. I mean, whatever it is, uh, you can come and, and, and enjoy outside. It's just a wonderful place, a wonderful people. And um, I'm always, uh, I, sometimes I feel like a, um, like a tourism representative for the state yeah. because I'm so, so passionate about it. But I welcome everyone to the state. And, uh, and if you do come, let me know and I'll show you around. Right on. Glad, right on. glad to know that you've been there multiple times, Paul. You're I, gonna have, next time you come, you'll have to let me know. I love it. I was uh, I was actually talking to my son about it yesterday. We were out in, in the in the mountains, and uh, I was talking to him about Utah and uh, talking about how I want to bring him there. So I'll I, I'll take you up on that. Um, yeah. We're shifting into a new phase of this show, right? We're trying to add height, uh, add light to the heat. Uh, you know, there are a lot of folks that are still angry because they're paying attention, but we also want to channel that into positive impact. We're also dealing with this pandemic. One of my favorite things about Utah is High West Whiskey. And so I'm going to keep some of the, the questions I had from angry Americans and bring them over to this new phase. But uh, I don't know if you drink or not, but Evan McMullen, whether you do or not, what is your favorite beverage of choice? Well, it's a great question, and even I don't drink. As as some people know, I'm I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints or a Mormon, and and I don't drink, and I, I never have. But I do have beverages of, of choice. Actually, I guess they're maybe less interesting than than others that some people might have. But um, I do love a Virgin Mojito. That is that is my my go to drink. 
Um, from a day-to-day -day perspective, you know, I've recently started eating extremely healthy, whole foods, single ingredient foods. Uh, and so I, I tend to drink water, coconut water and, uh, and La, La Croix or La Croix or whatever you talk, talk however you say it. So the great those, debate, <laughs> those, those are my drinks. So maybe less exciting than, than others. Uh, Diet Coke used to be a huge drink for me, but it was killing my sleep and my health. And so I dropped it and uh, I feel a lot better now, but that's as exciting and wild as it gets over here. Yeah, that, that, is, that is a great, uh, great insight into, into who you are. I actually looked it up. It's LaCroix. It's and, LaCroix. And, okay. Yeah, it's great debate, right? We actually had a discussion about this uh, with our Patreon members uh, this week about what it's called and it's crazy popular. And it's, we're yeah. probably going to find out in some years ahead that it's worse for you than Diet Coke. But, yeah, it's like cancer um, talking or something. It's a, great I it's a great question to ask. My very first girlfriend in high school was Mormon was a Mormon. And I, and I remember uh, that was my first exposure to the church. And I remember her mom pulling up to the house and my mom saying, come on in, would you like a drink? You know, and my, she was like, no, no, that's why. Would you, how about some coffee? And I was like, mom, we got to go through the list of the things that, that, that she may or may not want to partake. But it was, uh, it, it was a really great education for me into the church. And I think you've been a great uh, ambassador for Utah, for the church, for so many parts of this country to include the CIA community. But before, all right, we're back. Uh, so we had a technical issue that, uh, Evan, I think it was after I mentioned the CIA. <laughs> Immediately <laughs> after I mentioned the CIA, Wi-Fi doesn't work in my entire house and that's none of my Wi-Fi works. So that's well, what happens. No, no mentioning the CIA or all goes I'm black. telling you, man, I don't know. I, this is not a time for conspiracy theories, but I'm just saying <laughs> yeah, right. I mentioned the CIA and everything goes down. What or I was, maybe it was the, Hey, maybe it was the Russians. So who knows? Entirely possible based <laughs> off some of the conversations we've had on this show recently. Um, but where, what I was saying was uh, when I was growing up, uh, my very first girlfriend was a Mormon and oh, yeah. uh, opened me up to a whole world that I hadn't been exposed to as a 17 year old. And uh, I'm going in the way, way back machine with all of our guests, not just my own experience, but the next question I want to ask you that I ask of all my guests is when you were growing up, Evan, what was your very first car? My very first car was a, a black Scottsdale truck. And uh, my dad let me drive it. Uh, I took it to school, took it to work. Um, I would drive it way, way too fast. Um, I used to take it out in our field behind the house and jump it off mounds of dirt. And it was terrible. It was terrible what I used to do to that thing. But it was a great truck. It has a V8 engine in it and uh, it really hauled. And That's uh, I would push it to the max. I'm surprised I didn't die doing it. That's a really good first car truck, right? What, what yeah. year was, what, what, do you know what year it was? Oh, I, I have no idea. It would have been in the 90s, early 90s. Yeah. And you did, this is like my five-year-old son's dream. Like you would jump it off things. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, yeah, I mean, look, I, I guess I can say this now, but uh, yeah, coming home from work, I worked at a restaurant where I was uh, a dishwasher and then a cook. And uh, we lived on this long, straight, but hilly country road. And I would take that road home going way too fast, enough so that one of the final, uh, you know, jumps <laughs> um, would allow me to really lift the car. I don't know if I actually got air, but I was certainly not putting weight on the suspension at times. And uh, yeah, that was, uh, th those, those were some wild early days, but that was my first car. It was a great truck. That's perfect. After 101 episodes now, I have this dream of bringing everyone together in their vehicles for some kind of great monster jam party uh, of, of, of people of different backgrounds. We've got everything from a Model T to now your leaping monster truck, which is which is amazing. But maybe maybe fitting because we're all kind of going through this wild ride in America right now. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, there's a lot of reasons I'm excited to talk to you now. Um, but you you worked in the CIA. Mm -hmm. um, you were, you know, a, a leader within the GOP. You ran for president as an independent, uh, and and I think really drove him, drove an important conversation. But I want to start with what's happening in America right now. Um, yeah. Can you break down from your perspective, both as a political leader, but also as someone who worked in the CIA? Can you break down 
this moment where we are right now, the impeachment trial is happening, the insurrection happened, uh, and, and really specifically, Evan, how do you see, what do you see as the level of threat to our democracy, both from a national security standpoint, but from a political and social standpoint? Well, I mean, such, such weighty questions, Paul. I mean, I, I think the first thing is that uh, we right now, and this is what I spend, I mean, there's so much we could say about our politics today, obviously, but one thing I spend a lot of time talking about is the fact that, uh, that we have one of our two major parties that, uh, you know, has a, a significant portion of its base that is absolutely trapped in an alternative universe. And, and that's the Republican Party. And that's, that's the party that I've affiliated with, you know, my whole life until 2016. And I've been, you know, more, especially more independent since then, although I was independent before, um, but still affiliated with the GOP. I was a, you know, worked in GOP politics and in Congress and, and uh, you know, had always supported GOP candidates and all of that. Um, but look, leadership matters. And we had a president for four years who you know, ran for a year or more before that. So for five years, the Republican Party base was being pumped full of lies. And not only from one person, although that one person had the biggest megaphone of anyone in the world, so that really matters, but also by right-wing media, uh, lar largely, not entirely, but largely. Uh, and and so that's you know we now have a political party that that doesn't the majority of of voters the two thirds to to three fourths don't accept the result of this last election they think Donald Trump was the rightful winner uh, and you know it's it's tough to see for somebody who's come from the the conservative side of the American political spectrum it's hard to see that these are my own these are my people these are my own people these are the people I live uh, among and I consider you know their family. Their friends, uh, their their associates, and and it's it's tough to see. But I I, I think when we have that kind of situation, uh, then uh, our our democracy does face real threat because people then believe just about anything, and they're then willing to do just about anything. And we saw all of that come to head on January sixth, which to me was you know the insurrection, obviously at the Capitol is what I'm referring to, but. You know, to me, that was a 9-11 type event, obviously very different in nature, but shaking to the bone in the, in the same kind of way, where if you understand what's happening, you realize that American democracy is truly a threat. Now, there are a lot of other things going on. There was polarization before that. You know, there's sort of the, the impact of social media in, in driving us all apart. There are other factors there, obviously, lots to untangle there lots of reasons for our divisions. Um, but you know the, the Democratic Party now, the Republicans tried to say that the Democratic Party has become a far left party. It certainly does have its far left elements, but the fact is it's being led by a, a unifying figure in Joe Biden right now. Will the Democrats stay on that track? I hope they will. I don't know if they will or not. That remains to be seen. The Republican Party has given in to, to its extremes, and, and its, its extremes have made grounds within the party. The, pardon, the party now has become, on a whole, an anti-democracy force. That doesn't mean all Republicans are that way. Um, but increasingly, Republicans are just leaving the party because, mm -hmm. you know, no one wants to be a, or, or not no one, sadly, but a great deal, you know, thou, hundreds of, or tens of thousands. 140,000 people, at least in 25 states, have left the Republican Party since the in, the insurrection, and uh, you know that's that's probably that's a good sign that that people are rejecting the insurrection and rejecting that kind of anti-democracy uh, um, approach uh, for a party. Um, but there are still a number of of Republicans uh, who don't have such a problem with it, and. And I hope that'll change. But anyway, there's so much to talk about. But yeah. are, those are a few things. I, I want to go deeper into the political part. But before I do, I want to I want to bring you into deeper into the national security part. You worked for the CIA in the Middle East, you mm -hmm. know, fi fighting as a part of our so-called war on terror. Right. You've been operating in these countries, fighting insurrections, insurgencies, whatever we want to call them. Um, when you put that hat on. Evan, and look at this situation. Uh, can you talk about the the actual attack itself and what you saw there and how you think we combat that? 
There's a debate now happening in the military and national security community saying, yeah, if we call it an insurgency, let's not do counterinsurgency because last time we tried that, we screwed it up. So how do, what, what is it that we're fighting? What is the, the enemy or the threat or the challenge? And how do we win? Great questions. I mean, look, we're, we're certainly fighting uh, uh, the radicalization of a significant part of the American uh, electorate. That is, that is reality. P people are being, as I've said, lied to. Uh, they're being sold conspiracy theories. They're buying into those conspiracy theories. Um, they're frustrated by many things in life that these conspiracy theories claim to, to, to explain and to answer. Um, they feed into people's worst fears and biases and, and all of that. So th that's the first thing. We, we've got to address the fact that tens of millions of Americans live in an alternative information space. I mean, it's objectively that. And I know, mm -hmm. you know, there are plenty of people will push back and say, no, it isn't. We're, you know, we're the ones with the truth. But look, we, we have to call a spade a spade. And there are people just believing complete nonsense lies. And we have to confront that. It's very difficult to do that because if you can't do it through right-wing media, because right-wing media is a great part of the problem, then how do you do it? It's, it's a huge challenge. I, you know, and, and to answer your question, I, first of all, I don't think I have all the answers, but I do think the answer lies uh, in the business side of, of right-wing media greatly. Um, that that's one side of things, I, and and with companies who advertise and who um, who allow the promotion of right wing conspiracies. I mean, mm -hmm. they are you know we've got to change that. Now, you can, we can get into how exactly that can happen. I mean, with Fox News, for example, it's challenging because, as I understand it, most of their revenue comes from carriage fees. So the, basically, we pay for cable, and then they get a cut of that. And right. whether you fought, watch Fox News or not they're getting a cut of your money. We're all paying for Fox News conspiracy theories and divisive uh, you know, false content being pushed to tens of millions of Americans. We all pay for that. Anybody who has cable or some substitute for it in which Fox News appears, we are paying for that. And then of course you have advertisers who advertise on, on Fox News, but I think we really have to, you know, we have to hope that you know, Comcast and you know, YouTube TV and, and all who advertise on Fox News will eventually draw a line and maybe we need to force them to just as consumers of their products and say, look, you know, the country, the democracy is at risk. It can't survive if one if one of the parties is anti-democracy. We won't eventually we won't survive in the mm -hmm. same way we have. We won't thrive. We won't survive. This pandemic is a perfect example of it. Almost a half of a million people dead, largely unnecessarily. We're failing to govern ourselves, um, and and there's no way we can govern ourselves if one party is controlled by people living in an alternative reality. The other thing I'll say, Paul, is our leaders have to do more. Leadership matters. Yep. Leadership can re reshape the way people think about things. We all have busy lives. We're taking care of kids. We're trying to pay the bills. We're worried about getting sick, all of this. So we depend on our leaders. We have a representative democracy for a reason, because we, you know, we try to pick good people in theory, we send them to Washington or, or to the state capitals or to the local city hall, and we expect them to make good judgments based on integrity, our values and facts. And if we don't have that, then we're in a world of hurt. And I think uh, uh, to a large degree on the right now, especially, and I, I talk about the right a lot because that's where I come from and it's what I focus on and trying to correct that side of our politics, but. Um, but, you know, we've got to elect leaders on the Republican side, um, if possible, or if not, we've got to find them as independents or even as Democrats. But we have to elect leaders who um, will govern in, uh, govern in a way that is grounded in, in truth, in, in reason, and in our values. And right now, too many Republicans just won't do that. They're, they're the Republicans in office are more concerned with keeping their seats than anything else. And it's not just that. People always ask me, why aren't the Republicans doing the right thing? For years, people ask me that. It's about keeping their seats, yes, but it's also about what happens after they leave Congress. Once you become a member of Congress, many members think of their whole lives now set up because of those positions. So when they leave Congress, They'll work as lobbyists or they'll do right. other things that depend on 
the relationships they formed within the party when they served. And so that's why, you know, standing up to the party can be a completely life-changing, you know, life-altering opportunity closing in their, you know, in their way of thinking action. And so it really takes true patriotism and true courage, true selflessness. And right now in too many of our leaders, we just don't have that. And that that begins with us, though. We have to make that change. And we have been making that change over the last few years in this presidential election, with the Senate, with the House. But we need to do it much, much more until we get leaders who will do the things that I've just mentioned. Mm. I think there's a really good breakdown. You know, even the compartmentalization of it is important. Like if we talk about this as, you know, the working definition of an insurgency, right? In the same way, we couldn't kill our way through an insurgency in Iraq. You can't arrest your way through this in America right now, this extremist growth and yeah. this, 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 this ongoing threat to our democracy from within. So getting upstream, you know, in, in trying to get people to not become extremists, in my view, is really the way to fight extremism. And, and, and your point about the media, I think, is a really, really timely one. Because that's frankly part of why we created this company. We wanted to create an alternative and why we're changing the focus of this show because there is this opportunity to give people good information, right? Absolutely. If we can, if we can so peel important. off 25% of the Fox News audience, and you know, I'd love to replace them on every cable network with Righteous, but until we get there, we'll chip away and, and try to get to that middle. But there was also you know, a possible scenario, Evan, where we had Bernie Sanders versus Donald Trump. Right. That was that was looking likely for a while. And I'm glad it was Joe Biden. I supported Joe Biden. I thought he was in part because he was a moderate and because he could bring us forward in a way that I think was unique. And I don't think Bernie Sanders could have beaten Donald Trump, but we could have had a very polarized environment where, you know, Mike Bloomberg and others would have tried to make a play. You've been that guy. You, you know, I think you were maybe one of the most serious, you know, formidable independent candidates in, that I can remember, you know, a lot of times independent candidates get laughed away, right? Um, but, you know, you have the Ross Perot's and then you have Gary Johnson and you have everything in between, but you were a serious guy, right? And, and you, you know, you didn't get the numbers that many independents would have hoped, but you made serious arguments. Your, your background in the CIA was, I think, especially relevant. You were young, you were dynamic, you know, you did very well in your home state of Utah. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about what was it like in retrospect now, as we kind of Monday morning quarterback, what was it like to run as an independent for president? And, and now what do you see in this in this increasingly divided country for independent candidates, for president, for governor, for other offices? Yeah, well, the, yeah, thanks for the question. You know, uh, my experience as a candidate in 2016 was, was, was very unique. I mean, it was an emergency campaign. We were running for three months in the in the the last you know last moments of the election really i had hoped and and you know expected someone else to do what i did and in the end nobody else did and so i did i so i did it i ran and uh yeah three months you know very few resources i i had no name id when i started so it was a very modest emergency campaign at the time and but actually i felt like i i feel like i've been campaigning really since then it's just never stopped it just keeps keeps going it's it's an ongoing fight right we knew at the time that it was the beginning of something not the end and so um and so we continue that fight for american democracy and to unite people around you know american values and and our institutions and and you know liberty and justice for all these these basic things that we so often consider as you know, cliches, but they're, they're what America is, they're what America is about and what it has to be about literally in order for it to thrive. So, um, but as far as, you know, what it's like to run as an independent candidate, you know, it, it's very difficult when you don't have a party structure behind you, it's extremely difficult. But as you point out, especially on the Republican side, it's drifting further to the right. On the, on the left, on the Democratic side, it's uncertain what the Democratic future is going to be. I think People are happy that the, you know, most of America is happy that the Democrats and the country is being led by a unifying figure in Joe Biden. Um, but I think there, there still is a lingering question in people's heads. Well, what's next, though, for the Democrats? Is it going to stay on this path or is it going to drift further to the left? Maybe when Joe Biden, um, it, when his time in office has passed, you know, what's going to happen? And so because of that, I think there, uh, there is some there is energy in you know roughly from the center right to the center to the center left 
wondering, you know, and anxiety, I should say, but energy maybe for something new, um, for better choices, for more choices, for reforms. And, uh, and you know, we'll see what, what develops. There's a lot of discussion, especially on the disaffected right, about starting a new party or a new faction that might operate independently of the Republican Party, that might support good Republicans and oppose bad ones and, you know, support, you know, good Democrats, unifying Democrats like Mark Kelly in Arizona. Mm -hmm. He's likely to face a challenge from, um, you know, a, a crazy Arizona Republican. And, uh, you know, we as a nation across a cross partisan majority ought to, ought to be there for, for leaders like, like Mark Kelly. Mm. Um, so I think that there's, there's a, there, there's certainly an opportunity for something new on the center right. And depending on where the Democratic Party goes, there may be an opportunity for something on the center right, center and center left. Mm -hmm. Part of the problem, Paul, as you know, is that you know, if you're on the center right and you're on the center left, you have way more in common with each other than you do with the fringes of your own party. But the problem is, is that because we're funneled into one of the two parties by a variety of factors, you know, uh, cultural and uh, just the way our, our political systems work, those of us who are so close together, but on different sides of the aisle are divided. And so our political power the power that, frankly, the country needs, the kind of influence the country needs in order to solve problems and move forward, it's, it's not quite, it, it doesn't develop or it hasn't developed in the way it needs to because in that bell curve, you've got a wall right down the middle of it and people on the center left and the center right just haven't been talking. Now, we've started to do that in the last four years. That's how we got rid of Trump. That's how we've, you know, you know, now hopefully we're, we're going to get better, you know, a response to this terrible pandemic and the economic crisis that it's caused. Um, but we have to find a way over that wall. And, and I think, again, that's necessity is, is, is creating, um, you know, demand for that. And, um, and people are leaving the Republican Party, you know, in droves. And, and so it's, um, there's an opportunity there. Let's, let's see what takes shape. I, that's the same opportunity that I see. Right. And I think yeah. it's, it's always been there, but maybe it's more ripe now than ever before. I mean, even if the Democrats stay together, you're going to have the, you know, the increasing strength of the socialist Democrats, the AOCs and the squads. Right. They're, they're going to rip at the seams at some point, whether they stay together right. or not. Right? right. And then and then you've got the Republican Party that may blow up into two or three different things. And then you've got these emerging forces of the Lincoln Project and efforts like yours and others to try to unify people. But I think, in my view, the piece that's really been missing is leadership. Right. Like the, 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 the not just one leader, but a crew of leaders that can represent uh, none of the above. Right. Without being crazy, without being. Right you know, maybe where Ron Paul used to come from, but there was a lot of, and there's always energy. Even you see that now with Andrew Yang, right? Someone like that, who's an outsider candidate, he could have run as an independent, he could still run as an independent and, and, and galvanize a lot of votes. I think the piece that was missing, and, and this is no knock on you, is, is leadership, right? You came into it late, you don't have a high profile, you're building that, mm -hmm. but it's not like Colin Powell, you know, 10 years ago said, all right, I'm going as an independent because they didn't see the tactical path or, uh, the strategic opportunity, but now those things are coming together, right? And Americans, I think, you know, 34% of registered folks are registered as unaffiliated or none of the, they're the highest percentage of registered yeah. voters now. So there's this group in the middle or, or it, maybe not even in the middle, but in none of the above, right? Mm -hmm. And the other factor we've got in play now is, is campaign finance reform is happening in some places yeah. with matching funds and ranked choice voting, right? right? So these things could really shake it up and, and it could increase the opportunities at for governor, for potentially the Senate, where you've got someone like an Angus King and others that, that are now taking these spots. So is there um, is there a structural impediment right now other than money, which we know if you were a billionaire and you had endless funds, you could obviously uh, get further faster. But are there other structural impediments and policy barriers that you faced and at other independent uh, uh, candidates face that we who care about these issues should be focused on? Well, ballot access is a huge thing. Look, the, the parties have made it very difficult for independent candidates to gain ballot access. In some states, it's not so hard. Uh, in my home state of Utah, it's not so hard. But in other states, the, the requirements are really 
set up to keep independent and third party candidates off the ballot. And that's just, look, among many other things, it's just un-American. I mean, we just, we need more healthy competition, more choices for the voters. We need empowered voters. Uh, and so we've got to change that. But, you know, you brought up ranked choice voting. You, you may know that in Alaska, they recently passed in the last cycle, a ballot initiative. And the way it works is that it sets up an, an open nonpartisan primary. So you can be a Republican, a Democrat, an independent, a libertarian, whatever you want to be. You run in the same primary as everyone else. And then in Alaska, the way it works is that the top four, the top four winners, the top four vote getters, then move on to the general election in which uh, voters then rank their choices. They say, I like, I like Paul first, and then I like Evan, and then I, you know, and so on. And the reason why that's so powerful is that all of a sudden, Paul, you know, you and I are running against each other. And in a normal, the way things work now, we'd be, even if we liked each other, the incentives are such that we might, you know, tear each other down and, unless, you know, we turn to our better angels, which uh, you probably would. I don't, I don't know if I would. I hope I would. <laughs> but, uh, but hopefully we would both do that. But the incentives are such that we would, you know, most candidates would just tear each other apart. And that's the kind of politics we have now. But in ranked choice voting, what happens is that you, um, you know, because voters get to rank their choices, you and I as the candidates are incentivized to, yes, yeah, say how we're different, but we're also incentivized to say, you know, you know, I can, I might, you know, knock on a door and somebody says, I'm a Paul guy, I'm, I'm always going to be with Paul and that's just the way it is. And I would say, okay, great. Well, did you know that Paul and I agree on X, Y, and Z? And so right. we're incentivized to find common ground. And, and what that common ground really is, is those are the, where the solutions happen. Those right. are where the, the possible solutions are found. And so, so that's it, 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 you know, that kind of system creates, a, um, creates an incentive for more effective and unifying leadership. Yeah. But that's, that's the general election ranked choice voting side of it. But the primary is just important because right now, if you're someone like me, you know, I've got supporters who are Republicans, independents, and Democrats. And uh, you know, if I want to run, let's say I run in the Republican primary, then you know my supporters who are independents can't vote for me, depending on the state. My Democratic supporters can't vote for me, depending on the state. My Republican supporters can. That's great, but you know, but I, I, but I, I really have got to win over you know the primary voters of the party, which tend to be more extreme on both sides, on both in both parties, mm -hmm. and so it's very difficult for unifying leaders to even get through the primary process, which is why this idea of just an open primary and the final four or the final five, I like final five better, right. continue on to the general election. That's, and it's a ranked choice voting. That's why that's so powerful. They just passed it in Alaska. And you see, if you watch, you know, Senator Murkowski closely, for example, and she's always been, you know, sort of a unifying type, type leader. But she especially is now. I mean, mm -hmm. boy, does she seem liberated. Well, yeah. of course, because she's yeah. now she can win this, the support and, and the votes of people across the political spectrum for just doing the right thing for Alaska and doing the right thing for the country. And I, I'd love to see that in Utah and elsewhere. I, you know, I think the other factor that is um, maybe really critical here, Evan, is that it stops making independence the spoiler. Right, exactly. Right? That's always the big knock is you shouldn't right. support the independent because they're the spoiler. They're going to throw the election to Donald Trump or to whoever else, right? That was the argument against against Mike Bloomberg. You know, Howard Schultz, in my view, was like the worst kind of an independent candidate because he basically, you know, said all the reasons we need an independent candidate and then appointed himself kind of king of the independents, right? Which is the other thing that people will resist against because there's very deep populism, I think, around this idea of being unaffiliated. And there are issues that unite many people that I don't think either party has really capitalized. I mean, national security is one that you and I talk about a lot and work in that I think is still uh, kind of a, a layup in many areas. But the other one I brought up is marijuana reform, you know, cannabis reform. This is like a, a, an issue that I think would pull people from either party, right? And, and can really move forward a middle in a way that I think people used to kind of shun or just poo poo. Now it's really, it's a mobilizing factor and, and it crosses partisan lines. I think we see some of that around gay rights and civil rights issues, but, um, but there's still this lack of leaders, right? If you said, who is an independent? People are gonna say everybody from Steve Forbes uh, to Howard Schultz, right? Are there any up and coming 
independents or unaffiliated that you know about and maybe most Americans don't know about? Or is there anybody that might break, right? Somebody like Joe Manchin, who drives me crazy. And if I were a Democrat, I would have gotten rid of him a long time ago. You know, he sits in this in this nether region. Uh, is this a moment where we'll see Democrats or Republicans break off and 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 go it alone? I think it's possible. I mean, look, you it's all maybe it's already started to happen, right? Look at Justin Amash. I mean, yeah. he was maybe an early adopter of this sort of thing, deciding once and for all that he could no longer be a Republican a year or two ago. Uh, unfortunately, he's no longer in office now. But but I will say in my conversations with members of Congress, um, those you know, sane Republicans, you know, those are the ones I, I, I speak to often, although I you know, also you know, um, have many Democratic friends in, in Congress and appreciate their leadership too. But you know, look, we've, um, there are a number of Republicans trying to move the party in another direction and in, in, from Congress, and not enough to be clear, but there are, you know, we all know who they are. And they increasingly talk about the need for something new. And, and they don't rule out, you, you know, they, they, they consider, they, they'll talk through, you know, where should I be with the party still? Or can I not be with this party any longer? What would that mean? You know, so they're in that phase, but I, I really do. I mean, you're touching on something that's so important. Um, we do need, we do need these kinds of leaders in office. One way to get them is for people to switch out and say, I'm going to start, uh, maybe I'm going to remain a Republican or remain a Democrat, but I'm just going to act more independently and I'm just going to serve my constituents. The problem is that the challenge is that when you do that, the party apparatus, you know, they censure you. I mean, many people, many of your viewers and listeners probably, you know, saw the, 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 the uh, Ben Sass released a video where he was talking to a state central party committee because he heard that they were going to censure him because right. you know, he wasn't supporting Donald Trump. This is just happening. This is live right now. I don't know what the re most recent uh, uh, development is, but everyone should find that video and watch it. It's a great video. But the point is, as soon as you act with that, with any independence, you get uh, slapped down by the party and they can do a lot of things to, to really, to really hurt you. And so it's, it is very difficult. And then if you venture off as an independent, you know, being able to raise money and then the spoiler, you know, the spoiler effect gets in the way and voters may prefer you, but they fear, you know, the candidate of one party more than they fear the other. So they vote for the lesser of two evils. So they don't yep. vote for you and then get the worst possible candidate. And so the challenges are, are serious, but um, I, you know, I, the other thing, Paul, is that I do look at, you know, we think of ourselves as a two party system, but I have a nuanced view of that. You know, when I worked in Republican politics in the House, you know, we had one of the largest majorities that House Republicans had ever had. We didn't think of it as, you know, I worked in leadership for a while. We didn't think of it as a single party. It was a coalition. That's the way we thought of it. We had the Freedom Caucus on the far right. We had the, you know, sort of the mainstream Republicans, conservatives in the middle. And then you had the, you know, the moderates, the Tuesday groupers, as they called themselves. Mm -hmm. And we knew that we had that coalition. So is there a possibility? And the Democrats have those coalition type politics in their party, too. And that's I think that's just natural for a two party system. So there is a possibility of working within a party, but acting independently at the same time of it and sort of being able to rise to, to power and to leadership through a party apparatus, even while acting quite independently. Mm, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, when I look ahead, as, as we go through this traumatic uh, impeachment process and we explore power, right? Um, what, what I see happening is, is an overcompensation and a shift in the other direction, which could result, especially if the Republican Party fragments and Trump really rips the party in half, you kind of got like a permanent Democrat majority. Right. You could have this, you know, Democrats have been waiting for this forever and licking their chops. And, you know, they, they think it's their time. But, you know, I think that's terrible for America to have, you know, uh, an entire populace basically have, you know, a, a one party by default because the others are so destructed or, or divided. And, and a real world example of where I think this serves the voters poorly is the biggest election in America for the next six months is going to be New York City mayor. Right. Arguably. And, and in that election, it's over in June. 
right? They have a primary, a Democrat primary. They've got 15 candidates. It's over in June. June, they have the primary, and we will know who the mayor will be elected in November because no one else will be able to take on the Democrat. Now, maybe a third party person can come in who's a billionaire. Maybe a Republican tries to swoop in. But this is also in a city that elected Rudy Giuliani as a Republican, you know, had Mike Bloomberg, who was a former a Republican and then an independent. And now who knows what he is. But I, I think that's an example of where this is bad for the voters. And I think you're going to see you see that in other states where where one party or the other has a lock and the parties are the problem, in my view, because they're not open to relinquishing that power. And I hope that this is a moment where we can challenge that power. New York is, is an example that's going to be a case study. But but as the Republicans break apart, we need the, the ballot reform. We need public financing. We need billionaires, right, backing people probably other than themselves, right? If, if we had billionaires funding independent politics the way we had Soros and the Koch brothers and others, this would be a much more formidable force. So I'm, I'm going to continue to cover it. And I, you're the yeah. perfect guest to talk about it because I honestly think it's one of the most important conversations in America right now. And, and I think it's been so dismissed for so long that Americans are kind of glossing over, over it, but they, they want something different. And that unifying power of what you talk about is maybe the most critical element. The idea that we can create systems that force us and incentivize us to work together is really what we need. Otherwise it's gonna be payback, right? It's just, it's payback for four years and then they're never gonna wanna give it up again. So I, I'm grateful for your leadership. Um, I'm grateful for your insight and for, you know, you were 44 years old, I think when you ran for president, that can't be an easy thing to do for yourself and your family. Um, I'm 40, I'm 44 now, don't, you know, don't tell me. Okay. So you were 40 when you ran. Yeah. Yeah. So that, 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 that was, uh, you know, that's, that's a courageous thing to do and to put yourself out there. You know, we've shifted the show from angry Americans to independent Americans, but there are two questions that we use a lot that I thought were really important. And I want to keep them for now and ask you, you know, people are upset. They're emotional right now. Uh, and with good reason, because if you're not angry, you're not paying attention. Uh, Evan, what makes you angry? Well, you know, not a lot makes me angry, actually. But but the one thing that really makes me angry is when the powerful abuse the weak or the vulnerable. That makes me furious. And uh, and that, that really is is the only thing that truly angers me. There's a lot that frustrates me. And there's a lot that annoys me. Uh, but what truly makes me angry is when I see the powerful abuse the vulnerable. And, and I, you know, I, I think that I first realized that while serving with the agency over overseas in, in the Middle East and elsewhere in countries led by dictators, and just watching these, you know, enormously powerful, but fragile in other ways, regimes abuse their own people. Um, that lit a flame inside me that, uh, that, that burns even still today. And I, I think that, that is one reason why uh, when I saw what Donald Trump was and what I understood what, what he was, which was an aspiring authoritarian, um, you know, that, that was something, you know, I already had that, that flame in me against people like that, that came from my service in the agency. And, and then I, I knew what I had to do um, in some form, stand up to it. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's, that's what makes me angry. Not a lot, but that, that's, that's one thing. You're, you're an example in that way. Cause you're very cool. Right. And we say on the show a lot, stay frosty and keep your cool, no matter what's going on. Even when the CIA hacked my garage studio here and shut us down on zoom, you're over text. You're like, Hey man, it's cool. You know, you got a very good vibe that probably comes from your background, you know, at the agency and all these things you've gone through, but you do bring positivity. You're bringing great energy. And I think we need more of that. Now it's something we've tried to celebrate on this show. We always say, look for the helpers. And I think you're one of those helpers for our country. Uh, and you bring, you bring positive energy. So, so Evan McMullen, what makes you happy? What makes me happy? You know, there's there's so much that makes me happy. Uh, you know, I certainly my my relationships, my family. Um, you know, my my girlfriend makes me very happy. She's a, a wonderful woman. Um, you know, being in the mountains makes me happy. Um, yeah, you know, challenging myself physically makes me happy. Mm -hmm. uh, being on the water has always made me happy. Um, you know, service to others, purpose, 
um, these these are the things that make make me happy. And and frankly, I mean, this is very personal. But um, you know, I you know, I do believe in in God, and 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 I do believe in a God that loves us all, even as hard as life is, and as unjust as it is, and all the pain and suffering we go through in life. I do believe that that there's a God who who knows and loves us uh, each and every one of us, and and that also gives me uh, a great sense of joy. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. I, I really appreciate all of that. Every, it's every time I ask that question, um, it gives me you know a greater appreciation for things right that are around us. And it's it's a hard time. It's a hard winter. I, I have to ask you this question too because I, I find talking to our listeners, it's one of the most useful questions I ask. You've been through hard stuff in your life, right? You've been, you know, a CIA operator uh, in in the Middle East. Uh, you know, you've been on this political journey. Uh, you know, you ran for president. Um, you've been through hard things in your life, and and many folks are going through a hard time. What's your advice um, for folks that are going through a hard time right now on on how to get through it, Evan? Hmm. Boy, Paul, that is a big question. I I would love to help help everyone with some wonderful advice. You know, I um, you know, I'll tell you this. I've been through some hard things in life. Yes, you mentioned some of them. Some of them aren't really publicly known. Um, but I always believe, and I have always believed, that no matter how bad things get, there's almost always something that can be done, something that I can do to make it just a little bit better, and. I know and it's easy for me to say that because I think I'm, you know, I'm in a position to make things just a little bit better, maybe more a better position than many other people are. So I understand that. Um, but I, I would say that um, believe in yourself be, and, and think about the next thing you can do to make things a little bit better. And I would also say never, ever, ever give up if it's something that matters to you because it's you we everyone fails there are setbacks all the time but really what decides who wins and who loses or whether you win or lose or overcome some challenge or not most often has a lot to do you know of course there are health challenges that you don't control and all of that i get that but if you're not if you're willing to just when you get knocked down dust yourself off and keep fighting stay in the fight things will break your way eventually. It's just the way odds are. Mm. If you take yourself out of the fight, that doesn't happen. Mm. So you, you, you lose when you take yourself out of the fight. So stay in the fight. Think about those next little things or big things you can do, you can do to make things better and attack them one by one. And, and hopefully that, that gets you to a better place. But, you know, I, I feel humbled even trying to answer that question because people are facing so many serious challenges these days and they face such little opportunity in many cases to make things better. But, but these are things that I've lived by even during dark times in my life. That's what we need to hear. You know, you're, you're, you're in the fight and I'm, I'm grateful that you're in the fight and you're pulling more people into the fight and through the fight. You know, sometimes it, it feels like you're in an ambush. And when I was in infantry, you know, training, you know, everybody knows that when you're in an ambush, you got to fight through it. You can't stop. You can't go back. You got to go forward and get through it, get the hell out of the ambush. Right. And that's really what it can feel like for everybody in the pandemic at times. So right. that, that insight and motivation is really, really important, Evan. And I'm grateful that you're in the fight. We are still going to do gifts. I wish I could do this in person and we can't do that. So I'm going to send you, we, we got angry Americans gear. That's, that's now on sale. So folks can get that, but I'm going to send you some of it and we're going to get new independent Americans gear coming your way. Super Great. comfortable stuff made by the awesome. veterans of Oscar Mike. Uh, awesome. I got a pair of Tommy John men's lounge pants coming your way you wow. can, when you're just hanging out or when you're skiing. Awesome. awesome. You can gift it to someone else or whatever you want to do with it. But I got some Uncle Nearest whiskey coming your way. Awesome story. Awesome company. They've been supporting awesome. us. I'll find somebody who will love that. Thank you so now, much. Paul. Now, my wife says I should drop the peeps question. So folks who've listened for a long time, I'm going to do a shift. You're still going to get peeps for now. Okay, okay. But now that we're shifting to independent Americans, I'm going to bring a question for our first time uh, guests that I think is, is, is a tough one. In, in, in this country, there is now an independent 
third party option. I want this show to be an independent alternative option. But there's one question that divides all Americans where you have to choose. There is no third party option. So I'll ask you, Evan McMullen, the great question, pancakes or waffles? Ooh, boy. There's no lesser of two evils in that one. Um, I'm going to go with waffles, brother. Waffles. Yep. Why waffles, Evan? I think uh, texture. I think they win on texture. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, you win on texture and quality and integrity and, and character. Just really grateful to know you, to count you as a friend. Thank you for joining us as the perfect guest for this new phase as we launch into this in endeavor that will be independent Americans. Um, but you are really a person that, that's given so much to, much to this country and will continue to do that. Uh, and, and I'm going to have your back and I hope folks are listening will do the same. But thank you for, for all you do for this country and all you'll continue to do. Likewise, Paul, thank you for so much you've done for the country and are doing. And this is a great, great new direction for your show. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I hope it's a, a great success. I'm sure it will be and, and look forward to being back. All right, man. I'll see you up on the mountains of Utah at some point soon. Yeah, let Come me down. know. All right, stay, bye. Stay vigilant and stay, and stay frosty. I will. <laughs>